Hi, my name is Emily. Welcome to my garden. It's the place where dreams are cultivated. I have a great show in store for you today as we explore the wonderful world of textiles. See you in a minute. Spinning is one of our oldest crafts. It's even older than writing. Spinning is the art of transforming loose fibers such as wool and flax into thread. The earliest spinning probably just involved twisting fibers with the hand. This method was replaced by the use of a hand spindle, a stick with a weight which spins like a top. People depended on this simple tool for all of their clothing, blankets, rugs, string, textiles for tents, sails, and even baby diapers. Later, the spinning wheel was developed, which allowed continuous and faster yarn production. Spinning was hailed as the most worthy of a woman's tasks. Until 200 years ago, someone was busily spinning from dusk to dawn in nearly every home. It was not until the end of the 18th century that mechanical inventions swept spinning from the home and transformed it into an industrial giant. Every culture in the world has done some type of hand spinning, so you can be certain that this ancient craft is a part of your own heritage. I want to introduce you to one of my very best friends. This is Martha Maynard. She can spin, she can weave, she's a jackie of all trades. This lady can hook rugs. My teacher taught me how to spin wool. Hi Martha. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? Glad you're here. <laughs> you are, as I said, a spinner. Yep. You weave, you work with all kinds of textiles, but you also work with plants. Yes, I do. Teasel. A tool to use to, to raise the nap of, on blankets. These are so picky. Like a sweatshirt material that has a fuzzy nap on it, that's right. what it does to wool. They yeah. grew that on purpose. They would actually put this in a frame. In a fr mount each one in a frame on top of the blanket. They would raise just the nap to make the blankets fluffier. When they were all used up, they threw them away, and of course they grow everywhere. And this one, this is one of my favorites. This is Sweet oh, Annie. I, Sweet Annie. A lot of people grow it to make the basis for herb wreaths. They do. It's an artemisia. It keeps the moths away from wool. Now, how would you do that? You dry it, put it in some bags? Yeah, I'd dry it and put it in paper bags and put it in the bureau drawer or the trunk drawer. So this is an important one for you because I think you so, work yeah. with wool. Yeah. And this is one of my favorites. You, you're calling it a weed. A weed is but an unloved flower. This is jewel weed. You often see this growing wild. And it is, in fact, Wild Impatience. Nickname is Snap Easy. And they call it Snap Easy is because the seed pods, when they're ready, pop. Here we go. Poop. Snap Easy, they say. <laughs> this is how I learned. Martha's spinning. I'm behind her watching. And practice, practice, practice. Right, Martha? That's right. You have a favorite fiber with your uh, sheep. Oh, yeah. Now, you mentioned brown. Obviously, there's a brown, white, there's gray. But you also dye your colors, wool. Colors, yep. Yeah. I've dyed lots of colors. If it grows out there, I've had it in a pot. I wish I had paid more attention to chemistry. <laughs> Seriously, you children that are in school, listen to what I'm saying. If you're into art, you still have to know a little bit about other subjects. For instance, we're talking about dyeing. Mordants, they call them, yep. are different, and it will change the chemical compound of whatever dye stuff that you're using. Yep. Copper, alum, alum prima tata. Cream of tata. The color iron, wheel is out the window, even when iron, you're doing clay. Same copper thing. pennies, iron nails. So yes. if you did use different mordants, then you're going to change the color yep. somewhat. Of the piece that you're dying. Hopefully it's permanent. Right, and some are not. You can store most fresh dye stuffs for later use, although there is sometimes a slight loss or change of color. Tie materials such as twigs, branches, grasses, leaves, and some flowers in bunches and hang them in an attic, basement, or garage to dry. Keep an eye out for mold or mildew. Slowly ear dry barks and roots and store them in paper bags until needed. Tomato vines, before frost has nipped them, make a pretty pale greenish yellow on wool or silk if used with alum. Used with no mordants and in very large quantities, tomato vines make brown to reddish brown colors.
want to go downstairs to the loom? Sure. This is where I weave. This is my nest. Martha. Boy. I'm always amazed. I've been down here before, but I'm always amazed. These are all cottons and rayons. It's beautiful. This is a warping board, and what it does, it allows you to wind a warp so you can put the warp on the loom and then weave. And this is a warp for placemats and a long table runner for my sister's new dining room. But when you tie the leaf sticks to your loom, each thread has its place. Oftentimes, people like us, we're really artists. We see things in a very visual way. That's the way I garden. Everything is a work of art to yeah. me in that garden. It's a piece. Yeah. And I can see it follows through with you, with your weaving, your spinning, hooking of your rugs. She knits, she crochets. This is my loom. This is the warp that I'm winding over there. I weave here, and what is done is wound up on the cloth beam in the front. So, this is the beater bar. And in here is a reed, and years and years ago, they were made out of reeds. I had a great time with you today, Martha. Thank you for letting us come into your house. And Thank you for coming. Given the subject matter we discussed today, I thought it would be a fun idea to make our own little loom. What you're gonna do is go out into the woods, or maybe just the outskirts of your yard, and find some saplings. Straight branches. These are maple. You're gonna try to cut them all about the same length, and whatever length that you decide will be fine. Take four like pieces of wood, and nail them together like so. Open up that drawer that I know you have in your kitchen full of nails and pull some out. Nail them in all around the sides of your newly crafted frame. First step is to take your yarn and string it from one end to the other. The next part is the important part. That's an over under weave. The last one ended with an over. So the first one is an under. Over, under, over, under, over, under. When you're all through and your pattern is set, it's time to take it off the loom. Now to do this, you're gonna grab one end, one end, through it, underneath, and pull. The same with the next. So what you're actually forming is a stitch. When you finish that part of it, you will find that you have a completed square. What I chose to do with this one was to crochet around the edges so that I could make myself a little blankie for the winter. There is another variation of this that I thought you might like. I have another use for those jeans that you have in your material drawer somewhere hidden away. These were once a really good pair of jeans, but I guess they had their day, as you can see. I don't throw anything away. So I've decided to recycle them into placemats or a potholder. Showed a little bit too much of the backside than I think was appropriate. Thank you very much. What you're left with is a lot of strips and a lot of strings that you'll have to take off as you go, but that's okay. It's part of the project. Probably won't complete this on air today, but I want to show you what it looks like. Primitive compared to what Martha does with her weaving. Simple, great project you can do with the kids. And the best part of it is it doesn't cost a lot of money. You can see how great that's forming into homespun. <laughs> Look, I had a great time today. We part until we meet again. See you next time here in Emily's Garden.